Welcome to this special live edition of iTalk here on Euronews, produced in cooperation with Google Plus Hangout. This time last year, Europe was in crisis. The president of the European Commission answered your questions here on iTalk. One year on, Europe is still in crisis. You still have questions, but will the answers be different? Jose Manuel Barroso, thank you very much thank for you. coming on to uh, iTalk Live on Euronews. Um, my first question is, um, something has changed. I don't know if you saw the German newspaper Die Welt on Monday. There's a, a, a new op uh, opinion survey out. Um, Germans, 65% of Germans think that they would be better off outside the euro. 49% of Germans don't want to be in the European Union. I'm not talking about their politicians, the Germans themselves. This is serious because they pay. Look, uh, of course, when there is an economic crisis, it's only natural that the levels of confidence in the European Union go down. We are very well aware of that. But I believe that uh, we can change the situation if we have solid solutions for the current crisis. And I believe that in the response to the crisis, we are making progress. We are not yet out of the crisis, but I think we are now closer to a solution than we were one year before. OK, well, let's uh, see what the uh, solutions are that uh, you uh, are suggesting. Now we have uh, various people live, uh, thanks to our Google Plus uh, technology. Um, and uh, let's uh, say hello to them straight away. We have uh, Christos, who's a Greek living in uh, Dublin, uh, who's from the network Debating uh, Europe. Christos uh, is here with us uh, to ask uh, his questions. We also have David, who's uh, British. He's uh, in Edinburgh. He has uh, a question. I'm sure he'll be asking a question about uh, Scotland. Scottish independence, and we also have Giuseppe, he's an Italian living in Brussels, he's the president of the European Youth uh, Forum. So just a, a reminder of the principle of iTalk, very quick questions, very short answers, so we can get a maximum of subjects uh, covered. Let's go over to uh, Giuseppe, who has our first question for uh, President Barroso. President Barroso, 22% of young people in the EU are unemployed and the youth unemployment rate is over 50% in Greece and Spain. The Commission made positive steps to work on quality internships and a youth guarantee. However, there has been less focus on precarious jobs. What will the EU do to ensure young people can find quality and stable work? And will the EU stand up for the employment and social rights of young people in this area of austerity? Yes, uh, that is one of our priorities, is precisely the problem of employment and specifically youth employment. The best way to have sustainable employment and not precarious employment is precisely our countries to stimulate growth. And growth can come with confidence and also with the structural reforms that give our countries competitiveness. That is why to solve the issue of euro area uh, confidence is so important because only then we'll have necessary investment. And also some of our countries, and uh, Greece is uh, indeed one of the important uh, examples, need to reinforce their competitiveness. Now, apart from that, there are some specific programs the European Union is working. Yes, we have created a youth guarantee. Yes, we have uh, now with uh, some of our governments, eight countries indeed, uh, made a redeployment of the structural funds so to promote youth employment, especially in SMEs. But the critical issue is how we can reform the euro area and our economies so that they can become more attractive in terms also of investment and new employment. So we're back on message with growth. Isn't it a bit uh, difficult, though, to have confidence when we change the message? I mean, since uh, you were here last time, because of President Hollande, we're all talking about growth now. It seems to be part of the new message. No, I'm sorry. But uh, even before President Hollande, we had our European agenda, Europe 2020, for growth, sustainable, inclusive growth. It is true that because of the crisis, and because of the urgency of the crisis in the financial sector, we have been discussing more this kind of emergency measures. But our goal was and remains growth, I mean sustainable growth. OK, we now have um, a written question. This is from a Mosca fly, who is uh, Portuguese, uh, from Funchal. Um, the question, uh, I'll give you the English version. We are coming to the end of another year of economic crisis and the formula that was imposed on countries needing help has clearly not worked. What will you do to change this situation and to prevent more countries from falling into the trap of recession? Look, first of all, nobody is imposing solutions in the countries. I want to make this clear. When the European Commission uh, makes a program or discusses a program, 
it is with the agreement of the country, and at the end, it is the countries themselves, all the euro area countries, that have to approve it. So we make the assessment, and afterwards we make some proposals. But the decisions, the decisions are taken by the countries themselves. But when you are creating the supranational um, uh, idea of a bank, which is going to uh, control uh, European banks, you are imposing solutions. You are imposing solutions on Greece. We are proposing. The decision is not going to be taken by the European Commission. We have put forward a proposal. And now it's for the member states, in, for instance, in terms of this single supervisor, to adopt them or not by unanimity. I want to this point clear because some people believe that this crisis is uh, indeed generated to some extent by the European Union or by the euro. This is not true. We have countries that are not in the euro that are indeed having a big crisis, also in their financial sector. But or you countries said for yourself that the institutions the are not up to it sometimes. The, the creation of the euro has generated a, a crisis in confidence which perhaps wouldn't have been there otherwise. No, I don't agree. I'm sorry. To give you an example, the country that has mobilized more taxpayers' money so far in Europe has been Britain, by far. So there is a crisis in the financial sector there. The government, the taxpayers, had to intervene massively, and Britain is not in the euro area. Or Iceland. Basically, there was a, um, a failure of Iceland, and they are not even members of the uh, European Union. So it is true that we have specific challenges in the euro because we were not prepared institutionally with all the instruments to face the situation, but it is not true that it was the euro that created the crisis. This is why, responding to the question, I have to say that our program, prepared with the countries and not imposed on them, is, I believe, smart enough, and thus there is the flexibility sufficient to adapt them to the current conditions so that we can, of course, as much as possible, make them effective and uh, not make them as painful as they are. Okay, let's go over to Christos, who's Greek himself. I'm sure he has a, a question. He's listening to you. What's your question live from Dublin, Christos? Good evening from Dublin. President Barroso, what next for Greece now? Uh, the austerity measures have brought the country to its knees, both socially and financially. Uh, are we anywhere near the end of the tunnel? Uh, you spoke about uh, growth stimulus. Uh, what would that involve? Would we see new industries, new factories? Uh, how can we deal with the unemployment? We can deal with uh, salary cuts as long as you have jobs. Thank you. Well, first of all, it's important to understand why Greece came to this situation. It was not because of the European Union. Greece came to this situation because of unsustainable debt and deficits accumulated over the years. And so, in fact, the European Union, what is giving is an opportunity to Greece to avoid default. Now, I understand that some of these adjustments are extremely painful. And in fact, the Greek people have been making a huge effort. Sometimes people underestimate the great, the great efforts made in terms, for instance, of uh, um, salaries and other matters. Now, I believe that it is critically important for Greece and also for the euro area, that Greece remains in the euro area, so that this new program, is, um, these new um, measures are adopted as soon as possible, and that we are at the same time working proactively, for instance, with the uh, utilization of all the funds, also with the promotion of some of the reforms for Greek competitiveness, so that Greece restores confidence. This is critically important because only with this confidence we will ha be able to create sustainable jobs for the young people and not only for the young people. Okay, we uh, also had quite a lot of uh, video uh, questions uh, sent in uh, to uh, Euronews. Here's one from Irish owner. Let's listen. This question is on behalf of Irish homeowners. We would like to know if the European Commission is aware of the bank's blatant lack of engagement or workable solutions for mortgage holders in Ireland who are struggling with totally unaffordable levels of mortgage debt on their family home. If so, do they have a supervisory mechanism to address such issues? Thank you. That's an important question because, in fact, everything that happened in the financial sector in Ireland, but not only in Ireland, in all our member states, was under the responsibility of the national supervisors. But why, the didn't, why didn't the, uh, the European Commission, the European Union, the European Parliament say something about it at the time? Simply because we did not have the competence and we did not know. 
We did not know. The reality is that many of the developments in the financial sector they were, were only revealed now because to some extent the national uh, supervisory systems were not open enough. That is why it is important to have a single supervisor working, of course, with the national supervisor, but at a single supervisor, at least for the euro area, but if possible, covering all the European Union. Angela because what, isn't failed, isn't what was failed was not European supervision that did not exist. We are now creating it. What failed was not only the governments with excessive deficits, but also, in many cases, the supervisors, and, by the way, the financial markets where happen things that are simply, I mean, in, sometimes unimaginable. That is the reality, starting with the Lehman Brothers case, but in also what happened in many of our uh, countries. So aren't you worried because Angela Merkel has been saying this week that she doesn't agree with the timing of the uh, bank agency. You want it for the 1st of January next year. She says, oh, no, 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 that's way too soon. No, I think, uh, I mean, about timing, uh, let's see, I, I'm always prudent about timing. What I can tell you is that I believe we are going to have this single supervisor because it was, in fact, a very good proposal by the Commission and that we have made precisely when member states understood that things could not continue as they were. So there are some differences, but I believe we are going to have a single supervisor rather sooner than later. OK, let's go back uh, now to uh, Christos with another live question. You're watching your news live uh, here from uh, Brussels. Christos. Hello, uh, President Barroso. How can Europe deal with the, uh, the rating agencies and the, the demands and the pressure for the markets? Would the creation of a European rating agency help? And how could we regulate uh, the banks in Europe? Thank you. Uh, there is already a new regulation put forward by the Commission in 2011, but we are now precisely uh, studying a possibility to reinforce this regulation of the rating agencies. And I believe this is important. About European rating agency, uh, if there is uh, an initiative on that sense, I think it's positive. I think the more competition there is in that market, the less dependent we are in a small group of rating agencies, the better. But I believe it is not for the European institutions as such to create their own rating agency. It is very important that the rating agency uh, comes also uh, with the confidence of the markets and certainly uh, this will not be um, the best solution to have now uh, the creation by a state or by the European Commission of a specific rating agency. OK, I can uh, see that uh, Giuseppe is a bit like the Eurovision Song Contest. We have all the people uh, from different uh, countries. Giuseppe, uh, I think you have uh, a question live on uh, Euronews. Yeah, we are worried that despite uh, all the initiatives taken in the emergency of the crisis by the Commission, there is still not enough investment in youth and in the future of the continent at the moment. Now, how can you help us to convince the member states to focus on youth in the next budget cycle of the European Union? Just today, uh, I had a meeting here in the Commission with the President of the European Council, the President of the European Parliament and the President of Cyprus, who has the rotating presidency, precisely to discuss how can we have a budget for growth and investment in Europe. Because I think it is a contradiction when some governments say that they are in favour of growth and investment, but afterwards they want to reduce the investment at European level. Many of these programmes are critically important for our young people. For instance, investment in research and education, uh, also the uh, funds for cohesion, namely in the most affected countries. But that, once again, I want to make the point, we, have to, we are all of us in this together. The Commission can make the proposals, but we need the support at the end of the Member States. And the, the 27 countries have to agree unanimously on the new budget and also the European Parliament. But I believe now there is a greater awareness of the need to have a budget focus on growth and investment, including, of course, for young people, as you have underlined. And I'm sure we are going to have a, a compromise, I hope, a compromise that is, uh, let's say, compatible with the ambitions that we have for our young people. We have all know the, uh, the figures of uh, youth unemployment in countries like Spain, for example. What would be your advice to somebody who's qualified but simply can't get a job? Look, it depends on the position the, per the person has. First of all, try to find a job in the country itself, um, namely because of the very important opportunities that sometimes there can be created there. 
uh, if the person has not the possibility immediately to find in the country, there are possibilities in Europe. There we have now developed a system called Euros job. There are some uh, possibilities of jobs sometimes in the country uh, next door. But of course, what a person has to do for, for that is to invest heavily in his or her own education first. I think this is a possibility. If he has still the possibility uh, of getting more investment in education, it's good. If he has to go immediately for the job, there are some specific programs that all the national administrations have. And some countries, as I've told you, uh, the European Commission made a redeployment together with the member states for, uh, the, from the structural funds. They give some training and on-job training. We have covered more than 400,000 young people. But of course, I cannot, I have not a case of magic solution to create jobs. This has to come from the economy itself. Okay, still with uh, Google Plus Hangout uh, technology, we're going live to uh, Edinburgh, where I think David uh, has a question. Hello. Hello. Uh, President Barroso, you've spoken of creating um, a federation of nation states. Given the anxieties about the current economic crisis, how successful will the EU be in pushing for further integration? Look, I think it is important to be honest with our people. I think the future of Europe is through more integration. In the globalization age, our countries, even the biggest countries, they will not be up to the job. They cannot deliver because the problems are more and more transnational and the solution remain national. Even the biggest countries of Europe, when we see our American friends or China or other global giants, they will not have the leverage. That's why we need more integration in Europe. With more integration comes more democracy. And the federation is a democratic solution for this unity because it keeps the nations, our countries, but at the same time clarifies some rules of sharing the power, sharing the sovereignty. Now, I have not said that federation for tomorrow. I'm realistic. I'm suggesting some concrete steps. For instance, a banking union to have a single supervisor. That's a concrete step. But we should have an horizon and we should be honest. What, is, what do you think in the middle term, medium term? What is our vision for the future? And I believe it's a federation of nation states as the best way to assure integration and democracy at the same time. I think, uh, Mr. Barroso, some people don't understand quite. They think it's sitting on the fence because they hear federation and then they hear nation state. They think it's a bit of a contradiction. How do you define a nation state? A nation state is uh, Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, Germany, um, Ireland. These are nation states. So we the know. concept of national identity. These are countries that um, some of them exist for centuries as organized states. And we, I believe it's a mistake to create Europe against our countries. Because for most European citizens, their first loyalty or their first reference is their country. And so it's a mistake that sometimes people make to attack the countries. But at the same time, we need to understand in the 21st century, if we don't create and reinforce something bigger, that is the European Union through a federation, our countries alone, on their own, they will simply not be able for instance, to deal with the financial sector, because the financial sector is transnational and they will not have the leverage to deal with other powers. That is why it is a federation, in the sense it is for all of the, those who want to participate, but it is based on the nation states, having in mind that the, the goal is the persons. The important thing is the citizens, not the nations or, or the federation. Yes, the important thing a, is a lot of, of nation states soon. I mean, you know that last week, one and a half million people in Catalonia went on the street saying, we want an independent uh, country. Um, David is here from Scotland. Scotland, it's very likely, is going to have a referendum and may be independent from uh, Great Britain. You're going to have more and more of these nation states. You certainly don't want me now to interfere in those discussions in Britain or in Ooh, Spain. Scoop. No, it's for <laughs> them to decide. Uh, what I want to say is that for the nation states that exist, we should have a federation. And now I very much respect the democracies in our countries. It's up to them to decide how they organize themselves. I see that uh, David wants to ask uh, another similar question, which comes from this. Uh, David? Yeah. How concerned are you about the surge of nationalism? How will it, how will it impact on the European Union as, as it is? I think that uh, what usually is called nationalism, uh, so the extreme 
let's say, attachment to a country against the others, these chauvinist attitudes is negative. And we have seen in the history of, of Europe what nationalism could create. We had two awful wars, the so-called two world wars, who were here in Europe in the 20th century, not many years ago. So extreme nationalism, like xenophobia, like racism, um, like extreme populism, this is negative. Now, this is precisely why we need to combine what we can consider a positive thing, it's patriotism, the love of our country, with the citizenship of Europe. And it's why I think it is important that the, the leaders, also at national level, not only at European level, explain this, because I think a majority of our people don't want those extremist forces from the extreme populisms or nationalists to win. I think most of the citizens want, I, are proud of their countries, but at the same time they understand that the European Union is something that adds value, that helps them defend their values and their interests. Do you think that everybody has uh, the right to be represented at uh, European level? For example, the extremes, the extreme right, uh, perhaps the extreme left, does everybody have a right to be represented uh, in the European Parliament? Yes. I mean, uh, except some parties that are, perp it depends on the legislation. In some of our countries also, it is not uh, allowed to have, let's say, Nazi party types, parties that have their program just uh, hate or the promotion of hate or uh, racial prejudice. This is not acceptable. But yes, we also have already, we already have in the European Parliament parties that are very critical of the European integration, that are not only Eurosceptics, but they are sometimes nationalist parties. And in a democracy, we have to listen to all the opinions. But I am absolutely confident that there is in Europe, from the centre-left to the centre-right to the centre, a clear majority in favour of democracy, avoiding the extremes of nationalism or populism. We had a lot of questions on this uh, next subject. Uh, Sarah is uh, Italian. Uh, she lives in Brussels. She sent in a video. This is her question. Bonjour, c'est Sarah. Je suis italienne, mais j'habite à Bruxelles. Et j'aimerais demander au président Barroso s'il si pense que l'élection directe du président de la Commission pourrait aider à rapprocher les citoyens européens des institutions. Et dans ce cas, quel devrait être le rôle des partis européens Merci. So, uh, I think a direct election would be good. Uh, it's not possible according to the current treaties. That is why I've proposed in my State of the Union speech recently in the European Parliament that even before that change, the political parties present their candidates to the elections in 2014, that there is a platform, and so that we have an election that is not as it has been very much in the past. European elections, but in fact with 27 different national campaigns, but we have also a European campaign promoting a European public space, a European political system. That's and by extremely hard. Any country that tries to do that, people are just not interested in the European issues. Most people vote locally, don't they? They vote locally, but now, and that's interestingly, one of the paradoxical developments of the crisis, more and more people are discussing Europe, sometimes criticizing Europe. But I can tell you that in the coffees of Athens, people discuss what is happening, what is the discussion in the Germany. And in Germany, not only the elites, the people discuss what are these Greeks doing. So there is a debate going on. Now, are we going to be able to win that debate? I believe we are. If the national leaders and the politicians, instead of just trying to blame the others, have the courage to explain what we have to gain with the European Union and what we would lose if we don't have the European Union. And this is why I think the elections of 2014 are very important and that some of the parties that should leave their comfort zone and they have the courage to engage in the debate. I'm for democracy and for open debate. But and it's true that in the past, the European integration was very often made by implicit consent of the citizens. This time is over. We are now in the open world of the Internet. We need to win the hearts and minds of our citizens. And this is why I believe to have political parties that are really European and not just national, it is important. By the way, the Commission put now a proposal, a legislative proposal, to reinforce the European political parties as such. OK, well, you talked about uh, the Internet. I think uh, Duarte on video sent in a question which, uh, which preoccupies a lot of the, the younger viewers uh, on iTalk. Let's have a listen. There is a democratic crisis in Europe. I believe that the main reasons for this is that us European citizens feel that Brussels is not responding to our concerns. One example of this 
is the current efforts to censor the internet and bringing forth legislation to clamp down on our freedoms without proper democratic scrutiny and, in many cases, on behalf of powerful corporations. So my question is this. What will you do to stop the next ACTA from being forced upon us when us European citizens have clearly spoken out against this? ACTA, the uh, anti-counterfeit uh, trading agreement, which is very controversial, intellectual rights, um, are we going to have internet censored, are we going to be able to download music and so forth? This is a huge, uh, really a very interesting debate and a very difficult issue. All the governments of Europe asked us to conclude ACTA. ACTA, because it is important to protect intellectual property rights, because our prosperity is based on innovation, and without defense of proper intellectual property rights, it's difficult to uh, have this kind of innovation. So our intention was never, and this will never be, to restrict in any way the freedom of expression. For me, freedom of expression, media freedom, is a sacred right. It's one of the most important issues, by the way, we have in Europe, and there, are not, there is not in many parts of the world. Having said this, when there were doubts about this, we sent the ACTA to the uh, European Court of Justice to analyze the situation, and this is the, the situation we are now in, and I believe a true political debate about this. How can we promote at the same time freedom in the Internet, not restrict, but at the same time guarantee for the creators, for the artists, for the, the writers, the right also to to be their, their intellectual rights respected, I think it's a very important debate and we should engage in that debate. And, and who decides? Who decides how much they should be paid? It is decided at the end by the democracies. So we have uh, uh, the syst uh, democ democratic system in all our member states and by the European Union as well. And I think we should come to a good compromise on that because it's a very challenging issue. And let me tell you, there is not an easy solution. Just uh, two days ago, I received here very important filmmakers, musicians, uh, writers from all over Europe. And they are concerned the fact that now their right, their rights to their creations is not respected. So we have to find the right balance without restricting, of course, the freedom in the Internet. That's a great advantage to have a way that to say to a writer, yes, your rights to your intellectual creation or you're an artist or a musician uh, will be respected. I have a final question, which resumes uh, quite a lot of the questions that were coming in on a more general level. Um, uh, when you see Americans, they hold their hand to their heart. They're very proud to be American. What must we do so that Europeans feel proud once again to be uh, European? We don't at the moment. We're just uh, aware of the crisis elements. How can we make Europeans uh, feel pride when they hear uh, the European anthem, for example? And you have 30 seconds to tell us. Look, I think it's important to reinforce the emotion uh, connection, emotion connection to Europe, but this cannot be done artificially. Uh, this is why I think it is important to explain and to discuss the issues in a democratic way. I'm proud to be European because we have in this continent some of the most decent societies in the world. We should be proud of our democracy, about our social market economy. We should also be humble, avoid any kind of arrogance. I don't like this kind of to be proud because we are better than others, but I think through debate, through democracy, we can be proud of being Europeans without ma now making a kind of a decree to be proud to be Europeans, because we have more reasons to be proud than to be, uh, let's say, frustrated by our Europe. OK, uh, Mr. Barroso, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to all our viewers who uh, came in live. That was Giuseppe Christos and uh, David. Uh, thanks to the technology Google Plus Hangout. Uh, thanks to the European Commission for the use of its uh, audiovisual services. You can see this uh, program again on our website, which is euronews.com. It's changed recently. And don't forget to keep those uh, questions coming in for iTalk. See you soon from Brussels. Goodbye.